Hi there and welcome to Online Church with us today. It's awesome that you are joining us wherever you find yourself around this world. I know God is going to speak to you today. He's going to encourage you today because that's what God does when we're in his presence, when we come to his word, when we meet in this way. He knows you're connecting. He knows you're tuning in right now and he knows where you are at how to communicate to you, how to reach you, and exactly what you are needing to hear from him. So, as ever, let's have this big expectation from a big God, an open heart, and let's receive from God together. Okay, we are on a journey, and that journey we are calling just now, this series, The Holy Spirit, How to See Things Happen. How things happen in our life is through the Holy Spirit. And we are on part four of our journey together. And we have a kind of base verse that we are repeating every week because it's really important. And that is found in Zechariah 4 and verse 6. And it says this, Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by me or you trying and working and doing more or trying harder or all that stuff that is actually good to do. That's not ultimately what makes the difference in the purposes of God. The purposes of God happen because God gets involved in it through the power of his spirit. And we've seen since week one just how clear that is in scripture for us that God did everything through the power of his Spirit. There we were at creation, the, 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 the Spirit of God hovering, ready to make things happen. The Spirit of God comes upon Mary and there's a birth of Jesus. There's a, a rising from the dead of Jesus through the power of the Spirit, the Bible says. There is the birthing of the church and the empowering of the church to, to do all it was to do at Pentecost. There was the empowering of Jesus to do all he did. There was the empowering of a King David to all he did. And at the end of the age, the Spirit of God with the bride, the church of God says, Jesus, we're ready, now come. So wherever we cut this, wherever we look at this, the Holy Spirit is all over making things happen. And God wants things to happen in your life. God wants things to be dynamic in your life. God wants things to move in your life and he's saying to you and me today the spirit of god is the one who's going to make that happen please do check out the youtube channel and get hold of all of the words that have been brought to this point because we're kind of building as we go each week and so please do check out destiny germany and find the relevant playlist and listen to the words that have been coming over these last few weeks and get fully caught up on the fullness of what God is saying. One of our other key verses that we've kind of focused in on over these last few weeks has been Matthew 3.11 because that's one of several instances in the Gospels that we read of something that is very, very important and very, very needed in the life of every Christian. And that is what we find here. John the Baptist speaks And he's speaking about Jesus who's going to come and he says this, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's a very important base verse for us on our journey because he says that Jesus Christ himself will baptize people in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we can't get away from that word baptism, meaning to plunge or submerge. Just like John the Baptist was plunging and submerging people in water, he said Jesus is going to do the same in his spirit sense. And something amazing happens, something supernatural and powerful happens in that encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And we read last week how people started to speak in 
a new language, praising and worshipping God, a language that came from their spirit within them. A, a supernatural things started to happen, and we read all about it in the book of Acts. And I would encourage you to read through the book of Acts. Read it through and just look for yourself about all of what we're talking about, and it was the normal experience for people who became Christians. And one of our convictions we hold, which is so precious and so true and so important in so many areas of our life and walk with Jesus, is this conviction that we read of in Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We believe that. Every time you say to a friend or a pastor or someone, could you please pray for me because I am sick? You are saying, I believe Jesus Christ still heals today. And the reason I believe he still heals today is because he healed in the Bible, in the stories we read from there, and he has not changed, so therefore he still heals today, and I believe that. Well, if it's true in that area, or if it's true that Jesus is still our Savior because he's not changed, if it's true that he is still our helper and friend and all of these things we read of in the Bible because he's not changed, then it's true also that Jesus still is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit today. He is still the enabler in our life today in the way in which he said he would be. And so I want to encourage you to read the book of Acts and have a big expectation that if that of which you read there when people became Christians has not become your full experience yet to say, Jesus, I want this, I need this. And the three elements that we've been seeing that were in play were, first of all, making the decision to accept Jesus as Lord of our life. It's called repentance. And we say, I'm not going to go this way anymore. I'm going to go your way. You are Lord. And then we see that people who made that decision, they were saved on the basis of that. They were sons and daughters of God on the basis of that faith decision on the inside and the confession on the outside of Christ as Lord. However, they didn't stop there. People who made that decision were then baptized in water. They went under the water and came back up again, symbolizing, I'm dead in Christ, but I'm alive. I'm dead in his death, but I'm alive now in Christ, living a brand new life with him as Lord. But it didn't stop there. And we saw that in Acts 8 last week. Because those who had made the first decision and got baptized in water then had a separate experience of people laying hands upon them. And the Bible says in Acts 8, it was so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. And exactly what happened to the first disciples in Acts chapter 2 happened to them. And so what Jesus called the baptism in the Holy Spirit happened in Acts 2. It also happened in Acts 8. And it also happens, and you can read this for yourself, in Acts chapter 9 with Paul. Paul, who was called Saul, was on his way to Damascus. Suddenly there's a blinding light. He's knocked to the ground and he has a revelation of Jesus as Lord. He gets saved. He gets up from that place, can't see. And he's actually taken to a place, he goes to this house, and then this man called Ananias comes and says, the Lord has sent me to you to lay my hands upon you so you can receive the Holy Spirit and your sight again. And he does exactly that. He lays his hands on him, and the Bible's very clear, so that those two things can happen, so he could see again, and he can also receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, the receiving of the Holy Spirit didn't happen as he was knocked to the ground on the road to Damascus. And it says he got up from that place and was baptized in water. So we see in the story of Paul himself, there was number one, there was number two, and there was number three. Then if we were re read on into Acts chapter 10, you can read of a household, um, the head of the household called Cornelius, this man called Cornelius. And Peter comes, and Peter explains the gospel. And in the middle of him explaining the gospel, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them because they believed the message. And so there was believing the message in play, repentance, Jesus, you, your Lord. Then there was the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And they said, we knew that that had happened, Peter said, because 
they started speaking in tongues, just like we did in Acts chapter 2. He didn't know it was Acts chapter 2. He just said, like it happened to us. And so the experience that Jesus said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, happened to them as well. And actually, in Acts chapter 11, Peter calls it exactly that terminology. And then he said, well, they got saved. And also they've been filled with the Spirit, just like we were. We should now get them baptized in water. So we see again, one, two, and three. And we've been emphasizing the importance of having everything that Jesus has for us. Too many Christians stop at number one. I believe Jesus is my Lord. I give my life to him. I'm going to follow him. And they stop. But in the book of Acts, they don't stop there. There is baptism in water. And some Christians stop there. But the book of Acts says, no, don't stop there. Because whether it's Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, or we'll see in a second, Acts chapter 19, the Bible says, don't stop there. Don't stop short. There is what Jesus Christ himself said, the baptism in the Holy Spirit to receive. And Jesus Christ himself said, and I still do that. He is going to be the doer of that because he's not changed. So in Acts chapter 19, just by way of kind of concluding this kind of laying it out there journey that we've been doing, I want to read this story to you very quickly. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 7. And then we're going to change direction ever so slightly in our looking at the Holy Spirit in our life. And in Acts 19, in verse 1 to 7, this is what we find. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them. So he's asking disciples. He's asking people who have decided to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Okay? They are saved. They are Christians. They're sons and daughters of God. They are going to heaven. They are secure in Christ. Okay? So that's that. However, he asks those people, this question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That is a redundant question. If automatically that of which he was speaking happened when you believe. There was no reason to ask that question if Paul, the master theologian, knew Everything that you need happens in the moment of accepting Christ as your Savior. Otherwise, there is no need to ask that question if that was the case. So clearly, in line with what we've been saying and looking at, it isn't the case. And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And it's like that, isn't it? We don't even know there's a Holy Spirit when we get saved. We just go, whatever I'm feeling in my heart right now and the message I'm hearing, everything's clicking, yes. You don't have the vocabulary to go, oh, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to me and that's the Holy Spirit now giving me new life. And you really don't have that vocabulary. What we've got is an overwhelming sense of, yes, I believe that. I need that. I want that. And they're like, we don't even know much. All we know is we believe the message and we're following Christ. And Paul then says, then what baptism did you receive? So he's trying to kind of figure out their Christian experience to this point. And because he has the term baptism in the Spirit, obviously in his mind and heart, he and links that to, did you receive the Spirit? And he said, well, what baptism did you receive? They, they answer with John's baptism. And now he knows they're talking about water baptism. And he goes, all oh, right, now, okay, right, I'll come back to my spirit thing in a minute. But Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is in Jesus. In other words, you'd be like, ah, okay, so in the one, two, three, you've got number one. Number two, the baptism hasn't actually taken place since you made that decision, has it? No. That happened before that. Yeah. Well, look, everything that happened before that was all nice, but to be biblical and to be what Jesus said we should do, we need to do the baptism now, but this time in the name of Jesus, just as Jesus commanded. Ah, uh, okay, let's bring everything in order. That's pretty much what happened. He told the people, and on hearing this, verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we come to number 3. When Paul placed his hands on them, just like in Acts 8, 
just like in Paul's own experience in Acts chapter 9, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, just like in Acts chapter 2, just like in Acts 8, just like in Acts um, 10 in Cornelius' house, and once again here. There were about 12 men in all. And so I'm laying this out to show you, to, to prove from the scriptures, this is needed. Have you had this? If not, find someone who has, get them to lay hands upon you, and have the expectation that this very encounter with the Holy Spirit is going to happen in your life. Only this last week, in a meeting, we were able to see five people receive exactly what we're talking about and speak in new tongues. The Holy Spirit is the same everywhere, and Jesus Christ is indeed the same yesterday, today, and forever, where you stay, and he is for you. Let me shift direction ever so slightly just now. And because this coming into this encounter with this um, knowing of the Holy Spirit, this filling with the Holy Spirit is to be more than just an encounter. It's to be an ongoing relationship. And in John 14 verse 6, Jesus says these words. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So we're going to move ever so slightly now away from that encounter we've been talking about to a relationship with. And focus in on some aspects of what Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to be, and that is a Helper. Isn't that good? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to help you and me. And that's one of the reasons that he's come. And it's a good habit to wake up every day with these words. Good morning, Holy Spirit. A famous book was written under that title, exactly with this in mind cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Acknowledging him at the start of your day. Now, you might need a coffee, first of all, to... Well, just wait, I'm just waking up here. But at some point, at the beginning of your day, why don't you just acknowledge you're here, you're with me, you're for me, you're my helper today... We're going to journey through today together. I'm open to you. I am sensitive to you. I'm looking for you. And thank you. You are here to help me today. Thank you. You know me. Thank you. You know my life. Thank you. You know what's coming. Thank you. You know what's going on. And you can help me in a very real, real way. That's a good habit to have. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Let's do this. And um, here are some of the ways in which he can help you and help me in our lives. We could, we, we, we could choose many, many different scriptures. And so I'm just going to pick a few that kind of give us that launch pad and show us exactly what ways he helps us in. And it's not exhaustive. But for the sake of time, we've picked a few. So here we go. Acts 11 and verse 12 says there, The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. So the first thing is this. The Holy Spirit helps us in knowing what to do. In knowing what to do in decisions that we need to take. And in that particular context, it was Peter speaking. And he's reporting back about one of the stories we've referenced there in Acts chapter 10 in Cornelius' house because he didn't want to go. <laughs> he didn't want to go to Cornelius' house. And the reason was Cornelius was a Gentile. He was not a Jewish person. It wasn't a Jewish family. So Peter said, I don't want to go because Peter was a good Jew and said, we don't have anything to do with each other. I don't want to go to that guy's house. 
Although God had told him to go, he pretty much kicked up and said no. Isn't that quite encouraging that sometimes even Peter was like, no, God, I don't want to do this. You ever had that? God says, do this, and you go, nah, don't, I really don't fancy that. <laughs> At least we kind of get some encouragement. I love how God has not left out that kind of stuff from Peter, the big apostle, and just showed us how real his relationship with God was as well. But he eventually did go. And he went, and because he went, the story we referenced a few minutes ago of the Holy Spirit coming and the whole family getting saved and getting baptized happened, and we're talking about it even today. But in the do I go, don't I go? Hmm, I, I don't know whether I should go. I've got this kind of feeling I should go, but should I? He clearly then, in reporting, says, the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. And so the Spirit of God can help you in your uncertainty. The Spirit of God can lead you in your, I don't know where to go, I don't know if I should or if I shouldn't. This, that's why the Spirit is given. I'm here to help you make good decisions. I'm here to help you know the way to go. I'm here to help you have a certainty in an uncertain world. And so it's a good thing to do, to speak in that way. Holy Spirit, help me here. I don't know what to do. Do you know what? Even if you're sitting at work, even if you're sitting at university, even if you're sitting at home or in the coffee shop or whatever you're deliberating and looking at and thinking about, the Holy Spirit is there and you can consult Him. And then it's good to open up the Word of God, particularly to know what to do. We're going to come to that just now. Because in John 14, verse 6, the verse that we mentioned a few weeks, uh, minutes ago, weeks, goodness me. It says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now we find what Christ says to us in the Bible. And we'll, we find the teaching of God there. And so married to, God, I don't know what to do, help me in decisions today, is he Number two, helps us know how to understand and how to apply the Word of God. And so the first thing we maybe are saying in the morning is, Good morning, Holy Spirit. But the first thing we're doing when we're opening the Word of God is, Holy Spirit, help me understand this. Holy Spirit, flick the, flick the lights on for me here. Otherwise, it will be dry. Otherwise, it's just words. But make these words come alive and be relevant to me. Help me hear what you've, you're have you saying here. And help me understand what you're communicating to me. Do you know what I would recommend you do? When you open the Word of God, don't see it as I'm reading the Bible today because I need to read the Bible because that's what Christians do and I need to have my quiet time and I tick that off my list. Come at it with this dynamic expectation that I'm opening up another world. I'm opening up possibility. I'm opening up adventure. I'm opening up hearing from the Holy Spirit. You know the film The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia, the story of the wardrobe. These kids go through the wardrobe and they come into a new world. It was literally a gateway into a whole new world. You know, the Bible's a bit like that. We open the Bible, but we're not really just opening a, a, a wardrobe. We're not just opening a book. We're opening actually up a entranceway to find an engagement with Jesus and a whole new world. And we need the Holy Spirit's help to understand this whole new world. And... In Acts 15, 28, we read this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Now, what's being said there? This is actually a, been taken out of a much broader context that the churches that had now been planted and were meeting and fellowshipping had some theological questions. And the leaders of those churches and the apostles all came together and they talked everything through and then they went back to the churches and said, this is how God is instructing us to handle this matter. They all became of one mind on it. And it says that 
it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. In other words, they, they, they felt the leading and the clarity of the Holy Spirit on a theological word matter. And so just as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to help you and lead you into all truth. He's going to help you understand. He's going to clarify the word of God to you. And maybe you're not in the situation of having to determine theological uh, teaching in a church, but maybe you are in the place of simply saying, God, I just need to know what you're telling me in my life. And I would encourage you that when you read the Bible to write down everything you feel God's saying to you. Even if it's just crazy, you just think, well, I don't really know how to formulate that. It's for your eyes only. Write it down. Take a note of it. And maybe it's on your phone. Maybe it's actually physically writing it. And sometimes there's actually benefit in doing that. There's just something of that discipline of writing out that helps you process as you do. And I've got tons of books of notes at home. And you think, okay, I think God might be telling me this. I'll come back to that tomorrow and I'll keep praying about it. And they come back the next day and say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me again? I think you might be telling me this. You know, if you are, can you just add to that as I read today and just show me new angles and stuff? And if you're not, just let it go away. And then as you start reading, you start noticing this and noticing that. And that word jumps up out the page at you. And it, you think, oh gosh, that, that, that kind of builds on what I felt yesterday. And you write it down. And then you start looking at everything you've written down and you see, oh, God's speaking to me here. God's leading me here. God's showing me a direction here. And it was the Holy Spirit pointing out that word and pointing out that verse and, lead, and telling you, now read in this chapter. And he takes you and leads you and guides you through the word. And he's helping you understand the word of God. Thirdly, he helps us in kingdom adventure and our destiny. In Acts 13, 2-4, While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Wow! The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. It said they were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. This relating with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, move. The Holy Spirit says, go there. The Holy Sp Spirit says, this is the destiny I have for you. This is the work I have for you. And I've empowered you to do it. And I'm with you in doing it. So he helps us in adventure. He helps us find our destiny. He helps everything in this relationship as a Christian with Jesus to come alive. And there's purpose in it. There is a sending and a calling and equipping. Hey, if you're a Christian, experience in life is a bit dull, boring and humdrum. That is not God's plan for you. The Holy Spirit wants to help bring it alive. He wants to bring a sense of sending and purpose and destiny into your life. And in Acts 20, 22 to 23, it says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. <laughs> Adventure. He says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Why are we saying that? Why are we looking at that? Because he was compelled. The Spirit was saying, go on now to Jerusalem. He didn't quite know what was going to happen, but he knew it wasn't going to be easy. But the Spirit was leading him in life and purpose. And really, I don't know what comes to your mind when you read that, but I start thinking of James Bond and Born Identity type films, adventures and thrillers of adventure where the music gets going and the atmosphere builds and it's like, oh, what's going to happen? It's adventurous. And the Holy Spirit is there to make your journey as a Christian adventurous. Not for the sake of it, but for the purposes of God. He's not playing with you. He's not just sending you off on a life roller coaster for no reason. But it comes alive. And this relating with, with the Holy Spirit was bringing change moments in these people's lives, taking them on from one season into the next, but filled with purpose. 
And as you and I relate with the Holy Spirit, we discover him helping us understand, helping us know the will and purpose of God for our life, bringing to life the word of God, bringing us into destiny, bringing us into adventure, taking us on in his plans and purposes for us and enjoying relationship, friendship and fellowship with him on the way. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Let's do this today together. Amen. Hey, maybe, just maybe, you are been watching or journeying with us or maybe for the first time or finding us on YouTube, however you're finding yourselves, or maybe you're in a meeting right now with us in one of our locations. And as yet, you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you would love to do that. If you are watching on online church, then there's going to be a button appearing on the screen and you can connect and say, I want to know Jesus right now by hitting that. If you're in one of our locations watching this word, then right in that room right now, you can respond and say, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior and others there as part of the leadership team can help you with that decision. If you're watching on YouTube or another platform later, then you can connect with us with the link that's underneath this video and we'd love to help you with that. But I want to encourage every one of you to be open for the fullness of what God has for you, to know him as Lord and Savior, to make that first step, to be baptized in water, but to say, come Holy Spirit, Jesus, baptize me in your Holy Ghost and empower me for the biggest adventure of my life. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time. God bless. Hey, Pastor Liam here. Thank you so much for having joined us for that word. I really hope that it blessed you and encouraged you. And you know what? If it did that for you, maybe it's going to do that for someone else as well. So why don't you share the link on social media, give it a like and get the word out. If you would like to sow financially into the ministry here in Europe, you can do so by scanning the QR code or hitting the link in the details below. Thank you so much. We would love to hear from you, so why don't you connect with us and contact us and the details of how you can do that will be appearing on the screen shortly. We would really love to know who's listening and how it's helping you. Hey, God bless you. Stay in touch, stay healthy, stay well, stay blessed. Praying for you. Bye-bye.